War is a defining experience in human history. Down the centuries, we have celebrated great military victories. But history has also been shaped by great military blunders. Mistakes are inevitable in the chaos of war. But sometimes those mistakes defy reason. Was it a foolhardy plan which condemned men to death? A technology that failed disastrously? Interference by meddling politicians? Or a moment of madness by a commander? In this series, we draw on 1,000 years of warfare, travel four continents, to discover what caused some of the biggest blunders ever to be visited upon mankind. Even when I am gone, I shall remain in people's minds. My name will be the war cry of their efforts, the motto of their hopes. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military leaders of all time. A general's general, an outstanding leader of men, but above all, a commander with supreme confidence in his own abilities. Napoleon is a role model for all would-be leaders, even today. Perhaps one of these young Sandhurst officers may be destined for greatness. Getting there will take ability, but it also might require the sort of personality seen as deeply undesirable in any other walk of life. Every profession has its fair share of those who will be flattered by attention, who are vain and even pompous. Not all professions provide the opportunity for those qualities to be transformed into virtues. But in the army, in the right place and the right time, those very defects become enormous strengths because they're part of the showmanship which a general needs in order to get others to go with him. Arrogance, ambition, vanity. All these are virtues in a great general, but also the seeds of his destruction. Idolized by his troops, intoxicated by victory, belief in his infallibility grows, and those qualities which made him a success can now lead him to disaster. No one illustrates this paradox better than Napoleon. In 1812, he invaded Russia with famously fatal consequences. Napoleon was the greatest soldier of our age. He was a genuine hero. But he overreached himself through his arrogance and his belief in himself that he could spit in the face of the gods. And he came crashing down as a result. And he brought a lot of people down with him. And he provides an object lesson to any general that being a hero has great dangers. Early September, 1944, three months after D-Day. General Montgomery's field headquarters in France was the setting for a portrait to celebrate his glittering generalship. The certainty that he knew better than any other general had served Montgomery well so far. But over the next 17 days, as the painting took shape and a row over his leadership came to a climax, he would cause one of the great blunders of World War II. Two years earlier, Montgomery had been an obscure general, only promoted to commander in North Africa because Churchill's first choice was killed in an air crash. Not everyone welcomed his arrival. 
He was ascetic by temperament, a teetotaler, non-smoker, and this rather worried people who had to um, soldier with him. They all felt rather guilty with a man like this in their midst. When he was a commanding officer, as a lieutenant colonel, he was standing in front of his battalion on parade, and the chap in charge of this lot uh, turned, uh, said to him, uh, Colonel Montgomery, you are two paces to the left of where you should be. A lot of people would have just gone two paces to the left. He turned round and said to his battalion, two paces right, close, march. So in other words, he wasn't in the wrong place, they all were. Montgomery drove people crazy. He quarreled incessantly with people who had higher ranks than he. He was arrogant, he was impatient of people whom he considered fools, and almost everybody other than Montgomery was a fool. One battle made his reputation. He had taken over the Eighth Army, who had been beaten almost into submission by the brilliant German general, Rommel. Montgomery's conviction that he could beat Rommel inspired his troops. He would gather men around him, like moths to a candle, around his car. He would speak to them, um, man to man, and of course they loved it. Our mandate from the Prime Minister is to destroy the Axis forces in North Africa. We are going to finish with this chap, Rommel, once and for all. At El Alamein, Montgomery scored a sensational victory and earned a reputation that was to stay with him for life. His success was built primarily on caution. He defied Churchill's orders to attack until he had assembled overwhelming firepower. And it worked. It was the turning point of the war. And Montgomery became Monty. Britain's military hero. There was a tremendous sense in which Monty was the saviour of the British Army. And when he came back to England the following spring, uh, he was mobbed. When he walked around London, there were crowds assembled outside his hotel. If he was going to the theatre, people would stand up, bring the play to a halt. People reached forward just to touch the hem of his garment. This man had saved Britain and saved Britain's army in its hour of need. The victories kept coming. In June 1944, after two years planning, Monty led the D-Day landings in charge of all British and American forces. By early September, the Allies had recaptured most of France and were sweeping into Belgium. The Germans were on the run. Monty was hailed as the greatest military brain of the Second World War. Of course, one of the problems about a battlefield commander becoming victorious is that victory can go to your head. And there's no doubt that victory did go to Monty's head. He felt almost like a, a sort of biblical prophet. You know, I've been telling you this for years. This is the way to do it. I have the secret of success. Of course, my business, as you know, is fighting. Fighting the Germans. Or anybody else, too, who wants to have a fight. <laughs> Monty was about to pick the biggest fight of his career. Not with the Germans, but with his new boss. With Americans now the majority of the Allied forces, General Eisenhower decided that he would take over as commander in the field. Monty was furious. Eisenhower was an armchair general who had never even commanded men in battle. Montgomery was in an unusually bad mood. His egotism had been rubbed raw by Eisenhower. So in September 1944, Montgomery was eager to find a means to circumvent the fact that he had been somewhat reduced. He was no longer de facto ground forces commander to seize again for himself the opportunity to be the leader of the campaign that would win the war. The Allied armies were gathering at Germany's borders but where would they invade? Eisenhower wanted to advance slowly on all fronts. Monty wanted all the Allies' resources put into one concentrated attack, with himself at the helm. 
His instincts told him that the Allies had to seize this moment. This is the moment of decision. The finishing of World War II in 1944 depends on the Commander-in-Chief making the right decisions right now. Mont is driven almost to exasperation by the fact that Eisenhower won't make up his mind. So he decides he must come up with some kind of plan of his own. And that's how Arnhem gets dreamed up. If Eisenhower wouldn't act, Monty would. He began devising a plan that would win the war. In a surprise attack, airborne troops would land behind enemy lines and seize the bridges over the River Rhine at the Dutch town of Arnhem. British tanks would race up through the Dutch countryside to join them. Arnhem was the gateway into Germany. The Allies would have a clear run to Berlin. The plan relied on speed and surprise and was put together in a matter of days. Completely out of character for the ever cautious Montgomery. It was called Operation Market Garden. John Waddy, who served under Monty in Africa, would lead one of the parachute companies. We were, I, I think, amazed at the boldness of, of the operation. Our division was going to be dropped 65 miles behind enemy lines. Um, and uh, we, we were to be relieved by the armour in about, we hope, two to three days. Monty's certainty that this was the winning plan persuaded Eisenhower, who agreed to commit American and Polish airborne divisions to support the British tank advance. But there was a hitch. The RAF flatly refused to drop the troops by Arnhem Bridge. We were very surprised, horrified indeed, to find out that we were going to drop seven, eight miles away from, from the bridges. And we couldn't understand why um, we, we had to do it, except that we were told, oh, well, there's a, a lot of flak around Arnhem Bridges and the aircraft can't fly over the, over the town. Which meant they had to land, group, march eight miles and capture the bridge. And the moment they landed, everybody would know what their target was. It was obviously the bridge. Instead of insisting that the RAF keep to the plan, Monty was strangely silent. Caution and attention to detail, the qualities that had made him a great general at Al Alamein and Normandy seem to have vanished. His eye isn't on the ball. His eye is always on, why can't I be in command of all the Allied forces in Northwest Europe? I can beat the Germans. And he's not paying the necessary attention to the military operation in hand. And it's his operation. There was worse to come. Intelligence reports began to trickle in of two SS Panzer divisions stationed right where the airborne troops would now be landed. Alarmed, intelligence officer Brian Urquhart dispatched air reconnaissance to survey the landing site. And sure enough, there was no question that these were German armored units. I may be exaggerating, I think you could even see the markings. But there was a general feeling that it was Montgomery's operation, he must be allowed to go ahead and we mustn't rock the boat. The airborne troops were being readied in England under the command of General Boy Browning. Lightly armed, they would stand little chance if anything went wrong. But from Montgomery downwards, the assumption seemed to be that victory was in the bag. The thing that really alarmed me most, actually, was the state of mind, not so much of Browning, but of his staff, who kept talking about this operation as the party, and there were things about whether they should take their golf clubs or not, and uh, it was absolutely assumed that the Germans were finished, and I could not believe it. Boy Browning said we're going to lay a carpet of airborne troops into the fatherland, and I said to the chief of staff, I just question in my mind is whether they're going to be alive or dead, the carpet of airborne troops. Didn't he was furious. Brian Urquhart was spoiling the party. Browning ordered him home on leave. On 
On September the 17th, 1944, from air bases all over southern England, the biggest airborne invasion in history began. It was, it was fantastic. There was something like 1,500 aircraft and gliders, but 900 fighter aircraft, all in a stream of well over 100 miles long. Three hours later, they arrived over the dropping zone, eight miles from the bridge. As soon as I got out of the aircraft, it was obvious that there was quite a lot of enemy around there, because I could hear the bullets cracking around. We lost over 200 men before the battle started. And it was obviously then we realised that uh, things were starting to go wrong. Within hours, the Germans had blocked all the main roads into Arnhem. The British troops tried to fight their way through to the bridges, but they were surrounded. Only one small battalion made it. But the tank reinforcements of 30 Corps were struggling to reach them. They had been asked to advance on a straight road about 40 yards wide on an embankment with gun positions on either side from which the Germans could hit the sides of the Sherman tank. The Sherman tank was known to the Germans as the Tommy Cooker. It burnt when it was hit and no way of getting past them. Out of 10,000 airborne troops, only 2,000 were rescued. Arnhem was a complete disaster, a bridge too far. The route to Berlin was not as clear-cut as everyone had expected, and a war which Monty believed could have ended by Christmas would now go on another six months. Obviously, there was no way in which Monty could admit that this had been a disaster at the time. And he didn't. He kept claiming the battle had been 90% successful, various ratios of success he gave. For a general notorious for his excessive caution, Operation Market Garden was an aberration. He had become preoccupied with personal matters rather than military. I presumed that Montgomery always knew what he was doing. And it had never really occurred to me that people at that level did anything except for the right reason. And it certainly never occurred to me that factors of ego and ambition and vanity sometimes entered into these things, or indeed rivalry with other generals. Montgomery was undone by his conviction that he should have been in charge. But he had a point. At such a critical moment in the war, decisive action was vital. A general has to be self-confident, certain that his way is the right way. Arrogance wins battles. Of course arrogance is a double-edged sword. Of course it can lead you to be blind to what the other side is doing or to be inflexible. But if you don't believe in yourself, how are you going to convey that inner belief, that inner conviction, the belief that you can win a war to those who are going to follow you, particularly when they, many of them may die in the process. If arrogance is a double-edged sword for a military hero, so too is ambition. In 1916, in one of the most infamous episodes of British military history, tens of thousands of men were sold down the river, all for the sake of one man's career. This is Iraq, a country now rarely seen by Westerners. But in 1915, it was Mesopotamia, part of the Turkish Empire. That year, Charles de Vere Townsend journeyed up the River Tigris 
his mind consumed with bitterness. Townsend was a general in the British Indian Army. He had been sent to safeguard the oil pipelines, important for Britain's war needs. But for a man like Townsend, this was a cruel joke, a sideshow to the real war going on in France. Townsend's just about the most dramatically ambitious senior officer I think I've ever come across. He's never content. He, he's, he's always looking for the second or third job down the line. Early in his career, Townsend had a brief flirtation with fame and glory. In 1895, he held out for 46 days when besieged by tribesmen at Chitral on the northwest frontier of India. Townsend was promoted to Major General and invited to dine with the Queen. But over the last 20 years, his career had stultified. Now he found himself in the middle of nowhere, going nowhere. Or was he? A few hours upriver was a glittering prize, the city of Baghdad, in the hands of his enemy, the Turks, Germany's allies. Could he enter this fabled city as a conqueror, Townsend of Baghdad? Baghdad's quite a romantic city. It's a city that most of the people back in the United Kingdom would have heard of. And the first British soldier to enter Baghdad as a conqueror is going to be someone who's going to be very famous. Yet the terrain he surveyed on his arrival was enough to depress any military commander. Mesopotamia is an incredibly difficult theater of war to operate in. Uh, there are no roads, uh, there are no railways south of Baghdad. That means you can't move large amounts of men and large amounts of supplies quickly. You have to rely upon the river. And the British had very few river steamers. Turning a blind eye to these problems, Townsend began to advance up the river Tigris, 400 miles to Baghdad. Town after town along the river capitulated. Townsend's military astuteness, an incompetent enemy, and luck all played their part. The Turkish army fell back in disarray. It was a spectacular advance, very bold, uh, very imaginative. Uh, and of course, in, in, in 1915, nowhere else in the First World War was there any similar spectacular success. So Townsend overnight becomes a, a British sensation. Being front page news was pushing him on recklessly towards Baghdad. Further and further into the heat and emptiness. And further and further away from his supplies. At Tessaphon, only 16 miles from Baghdad, the easily won victories were to end. The center of the, the battlefield of Tessaphon is the arch, and it's immensely powerful for Townsend, the student of military history, because this marks the extremity of the Roman Empire. Here, at the edge of the classical world, the Turks were ready and waiting. The British were cut apart by their gunners. Townsend had no reinforcements and no supplies. What's more, a further 30,000 Turks were on their way. So near to Baghdad, yet so far. Townsend led a long retreat back down the Tigris, now pursued by his enemy. Retreating from, from the Battle of Tessiphon for Townsend uh, shatters his dreams of a glorious entry into Baghdad. It could lead to the Mesopotamian campaign becoming a backwater. Well, what can he do in such circumstances? Uh, and I, I suggest a heroic siege certainly meets the bill if you want to get back into the public's eye. 
He knew that from Chitral. I mean, that had been on the front pages of the papers. But much more recently, or more recently, uh, the siege of Mafeking had made Baden-Powell's reputation, had made Baden-Powell a household name, uh, and had pr prompted enormous jubilation when the siege had been lifted. Townsend sailed his exhausted men towards Kut, a town on the river that he had captured from the Turks only weeks earlier. He set up his headquarters in this house. He calculated that he couldn't lose. The British government would have to send a relief force. And when it arrived, it would come under his command. He would be promoted and able to resume his advance on Baghdad. It would be a brief siege, glorious for Townsend, if not for those he led. Townsend's attitude is so lacking in any genuine care for his men. This can be, be seen in the continued enjoyment of the privileges of rank, of decent food, decent alcohol, uh, and a, a stunningly selfish use of limited radio communication time which meant that his men received no messages, no mail, but Townsend is busy sending messages to friends back in London. Townsend radioed for the relief force to come quickly. By a strange coincidence, the man chosen to relieve the valiant general was none other than Sir Felix Aylmer, VC, the very same man who had rescued him from Chitral 20 years earlier. Townsend urged him to come with all speed. He said he was running out of food. But the Turks had surrounded the town. 23,000 men in the relief force would die in futile attempts to break through to Kut. Townsend accused Aylmer of not trying hard enough. Aylmer felt not unreasonably that he had been pushed into attacks with insufficient preparation and insufficient forces precisely because, because Townsend had effectively cried wolf. There had been no danger of starvation. Townsend had been economical with the truth. When the high command suggested perhaps he ought to fight his way out of Kut, he came clean. He then decides to tell his superiors that he has many more supplies than he let them know and wouldn't it be a good idea if the relief effort's more methodical and surely he doesn't need to try this rather risky breakout idea. And it becomes obvious as the months go on, as relief is not imminent, how frustrating this is for Townsend and how he sees his entire career being sidelined. Indeed, the appointment of Major General Gorringe, one of his rivals, as Lieutenant General in the last month of the the siege is something that really upsets Townsend. Uh, he bursts into tears and cries on the shoulders of one of his junior officers. Not normal behaviour for a British general. After four months, the British troops really were facing starvation. Towards the end of the siege, life for the, the British soldiers in Sidecut is dreadful. Uh, so desperate are they for food. There are people eating grass, and indeed Brigadier Houghton, one of the brigade commanders, dies of eating grass. Townsend's busy lobbying for the advancement of his own career and his own promotion, which is extraordinary given the situation that he's in, and perhaps also reflects his failure to realize that his career is probably on the line rather than confronting advancement. After five months in Kut, Townsend left his headquarters for the last time. There were no more relief columns coming. The longest siege in British history ended, not with glory, but surrender. The Turks accorded their captive full military honors and a first-class train ticket to Constantinople. 
Townsend went without a backward glance. He was housed in a small palace. Uh, he was given freedom. He even had his own yacht at his disposal. Uh, he had a, a couple of servants. Uh, and he moved in the highest Turkish society. His men faced a very different fate. Just under 13,000 uh, soldiers and camp followers were marched off into captivity. And their captivity can only be described as horrendous. 60% of the British prisoners died, and over 30% of the Indian prisoners and camp followers died. A total of 40,000 men were sacrificed at the altar of obsessive ambition. Townsend had neither inquired about them, nor cared. He never held a senior military post again. When I first clapped eyes on him, I fell madly in love. I mean, here was a magnificence I had never known. Here was a man who held in personal contempt presidents, who had met kings and queens, and all of us felt that the more we glorified him, the more we ourselves were deified in some way. And we were like disciples to, to a Christ. And I remember one time, in, before I put his mail on, the, on his desk, a, a card, and I read it, and it was from his pilot, and it said, to one who walks and talks with God. And I thought, my God in heaven. But that's his own pilot who wrote him that. And I think all of us weaker mortals are, are simply overwhelmed by someone who is that certain, who is that right. Arrogance and ambition have ruined the greatest of generals, but vanity can be just as deadly. With thoughts of the hereafter on his mind, one general did a deal with the city authorities of Norfolk, Virginia. He would have a tomb fit for a president and the city would attract tourists, pilgrims to his memorial. Here we have a mural of General MacArthur uh, during World War I. How come he's not wearing a helmet? General MacArthur didn't always do what he was supposed to. Douglas MacArthur was the most controversial general of the 20th century, a national hero who brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. The son of a Civil War hero, MacArthur had a lot to live up to. At West Point, the American Military Academy, he acquired a reputation for melodrama. I think it's called Sarah Bernhardt. I think because some of his contemporaries thought uh, there was something a little feminine about him, that, that this was a guy who, who uh, was very moody and uh, tended to cover his own sense of insecurity, which I think he had by being excessively uh, egotistical and self-centered and, and dramatic. He had a very domineering mother who, when he was at West Point, got a hotel room that overlooked his room and could see when his light was on that he was working properly. And she spent four years, you can visualize it, sitting in a hotel room supervising her son. Despite, or perhaps because of his mother, MacArthur excelled at West Point and went on to distinguish himself on the battlefields of World War I. He became America's highest decorated officer. In the 30s, MacArthur was posted to Washington. It put him in daily contact with the press. 
most American institutions had begun to realize there was something called public relations and advertising. And MacArthur, in fact, was in the public relations and advertising for the U.S. Army. He became um, responsible for briefing newspaper reporters about military events. And I think that that certainly began to, to give him a sense that you could perhaps create your own reality simply by being persuasive. 1942 was the year that MacArthur became a national hero. He was commander in the Philippines, the front line in the war with Japan. Things were going badly. Pearl Harbor should have been a warning to him. But nine hours later, his air force was wiped out, sitting ducks on the airfield. Then the Japanese invaded. To prevent MacArthur being captured, Washington ordered him out. And he went, leaving his army behind, earning taunts of cowardice from the Japanese. It was a terrible feat for MacArthur. I mean, he was humiliated by it. Franklin Roosevelt then gave him a Medal of Honor. So Roosevelt was, to some degree, responsible for creating this Frankensteinian monster that he then couldn't get rid of. The general snatched victory from defeat by his skillful use of the press, presenting an image not of failure, but of indomitable spirit. I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. MacArthur mania swept the United States. man was a superb manipulator of the popular press. He called my army, my navy, my air force. He was very reluctant to give other people credit. If reporters came in and, and didn't report him the way he wanted to be reported, then he managed to get rid of them. MacArthur's stage-managed return to the Philippines became one of the most powerful images of World War II. He was unstoppable and was chosen to preside over the symbolic ending of the war, the Japanese surrender. Okay, if you look at the mural over here, it is the actual signing of the instrument of surrender. Over here we have General MacArthur. And next he was now to become Japan's absolute ruler, a surrogate emperor entrusted with rebuilding the country. The MacArthurs were the royal family in all but name, answerable to no one. No American had ever held such power. He becomes like an imperial pro-consul in Japan, where he's, he's running the country, and he surrounds himself with a Praetorian guard of, of, of um, military police who push people out of the way when he appears. And so he becomes totally overwhelmed, I think, by this power and love of his own image. And now we're entering the Korean gallery. And you all know about the Korean War, the first time that the Cold War went hot. And of course, the war began on June 25th, 1950, when North Korea invaded South Korea. The call went out to MacArthur in Japan to beat back this communist invasion he would lead a United Nations army. Aged 70 and a five-star general, he outranked even his superiors in Washington. Korea became the place to test American resolve against communism, to sweep back communism, to punish communism, and not incidentally make his own reputation as he had made it in the Second World War. But MacArthur soon began to exhibit the violent mood swings that had characterized his whole life. At one point, he talked about, in almost a giddy way, that he could defeat the North Koreans with one hand tied behind his back. A day or two later, he described himself as a despair over the collapse of the South Korean army and fear that the American defense lines would be pushed back to California. His fear seemed justified when, by September, the North Korean army had captured most of South Korea. But MacArthur had a plan. Bold and imaginative, he would land a huge force 
200 miles behind the North Korean front line at a deserted mudflat called Incheon. Incheon, ironically, despite the physical dangers of high tides and uncertain seas and mudflats, was a virtually uncontested landing. Uh, the American forces went ashore with nary a casualty. Uh, it proved to many, not least of all to MacArthur, his own strategic brilliance. As Omar Bradley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said, after Incheon, it was almost impossible to question anything MacArthur did. Now the North Koreans were on the run, and MacArthur was determined to chase after them, no matter where the chase would take him. Soon the Americans were heading straight for the border with China. The Chinese began to make threatening noises. MacArthur was only encouraged. As he said to a friend, I don't know if the Chinese will enter the war in Korea, but I get down on my knees every night and pray they do, so I can achieve the kind of victory that America needs. America was, I think, code word for MacArthur as well. The last thing America needed was war with China. Alarmed, President Truman demanded that MacArthur come back and explain himself. MacArthur refused. The president was forced to fly to the Far East to remonstrate with his maverick commander. Truman wanted assurances that the war was approaching its conclusion. MacArthur assured him that was the case, that he could easily handle a Chinese intervention. If it did occur, he didn't think it would. And there was really nothing to worry about. Perhaps the war would even be over by Christmas. In private, each of them expressed contempt for the other. Truman talked about the strutting general who you know, didn't salute him correctly and wore a dirty uniform and a crumpled hat. MacArthur talked about the, um, Truman's ignorance and incompetence. And each of them, despite their public assurances that they had reached the meeting of the minds, expressed contempt bordering on hatred to the other. MacArthur's arrogance was not confined to the way he treated his own president. He was equally scornful of the Chinese and their leader, Mao Zedong. The Chinese would use this to their advantage. And MacArthur was arrogant, and Mao believed arrogance was very important for a successful military leader. However, on the other hand, arrogance can also make a military leader blind. And also, for Mao, it was not MacArthur's hostility toward China which made him angry. What made him angry was MacArthur's disdain, ignorance of possible Chinese intention of intervention. And Mao saying, OK, you did not treat us seriously. I will force you to treat us seriously. MacArthur chose to ignore warnings that 200,000 Chinese were moving towards the border at the frozen Yalu River. After all, there was no sign of them anywhere. They intentionally withdrew, hiding communist forces in the mountainous area, induced the enemy to march forward and prepare a trap for them. It was a trick. Suddenly, nearly 400,000 Chinese poured out of the hills. The US 8th Army took 11,000 casualties in the first few days. Facing certain defeat, they began a straggling 300-mile retreat, the longest in American military history. MacArthur suddenly began sending the most blood-curdling telegrams to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Chinese hordes are beginning to infiltrate North Korea. Unless I am given authority to bomb everything standing along the North Korean-China border, my command faces destruction. The war had become personalized. The strategy had been reduced, in a sense, to personal tantrum. Not national policy, not larger goals in the Cold War, but getting revenge against the Chinese generals who had made a fool out of him. MacArthur began to advocate the use of nuclear weapons. 
The war had largely stabilized. There was no danger to American troops. But MacArthur was listing 21 sites that could be bombed in China using atomic bombs. He wants to bomb Chinese cities. He wants a block naval blockade. And he clearly, he wants a, a major escalation of the war and turn it into a new war, one really on China. But Truman didn't want to be the man who started World War III. He began putting out peace feelers to the Chinese, offering to pull back to the South Korean border. It was a situation of the utmost delicacy. And to the horror of Harry Truman, on March 24th, just the day, day or so before Truman was to present this to the Chinese, MacArthur went forward in a press release at a news conference and announced that the Chinese had been exposed in Korea as a third-rate army of barbarians. They had failed in their attempt to conquer Korea. And he would give them one last chance to surrender personally to him. But if they chose not to surrender, he would feel unencumbered and free to release the American Air Force and Navy to bombard Chinese territory. And in fact, from that moment on, Truman began writing in his diary that the big general in the Far East has to be removed. The time has come. The storm which has been brewing between Washington and General MacArthur finally breaks with the news that the Supreme Commander has been dismissed by President Truman. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea and to prevent a third world war. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. MacArthur was the first general to be removed by an American president. Vanity, pride, and arrogance led the general to believe that he was a better guardian of the nation's security than the elected head of state. He'd held a very different view back in the 1930s. I invite attention to the obvious fact that the soldier does not declare war. Our Congress alone has that responsibility and power. Our army is maintained solely for the preservation of peace. In April 1951, MacArthur returned to the United States after an absence of 15 years. The wayward general received the biggest ticker tape welcome in history. Just about everybody is out today. An estimated seven and one half million men, women and children. To the American public, he was still their hero. Heroes are necessary in a military sense because people need someone to follow who they will believe in and will get them through the danger and will win. The problem arises when this person is surrounded by a staff who don't argue with him anymore, surrounded by press that he has been cultivating and the adulation is in the headlines and he then starts to believe that he's invincible, that he's God and that he's going to get it right all the time. The Romans had an interesting way of dealing with this. In the triumphal procession of any general in Rome, on the chariot behind the general was always a slave who whispered in his ear, remember you are mortal. <laughs>